you know I'm probably looking at the most rested crew on Sunday morning because of time change, right? Everybody's fully rested. So I feel really good this morning. Even better seeing your faces. Okay, so Donald, open us up in a word of prayer, please. We come, Lord, to give thanks for the beautiful day that you have blessed us with. We thank you for all that you will do with us and for us, and we thank you for the blessings of the day. We thank you for the brothers and sisters who come together today, Lord, to celebrate Holy Communion with ourselves and with you, Lord, and we thank you for that. We thank you for all that you will do with us and for us, and we thank you, Lord, for your love. In your compassion, in your name, Jesus, amen. Amen. Thank you, Donald. Let's go ahead and open our hymn books, number 494. Number 494. I think this is familiar to everybody. The piano player the man on the platform and you all there so join me in standing let's sing 494 <laughs> Next week, if she's here. And then Lizzie to Staffen. 
your birthday this coming week, is it going to be your birthday all day long? Sure. <laughs> that means your family's going to recognize it all day long? Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Whoa. All right. <laughs> and then, Linda, you'll have to send our best regards to Kristen. She's got a birthday this week, too. So let's give a round of applause to Lizzie. Happy birthday. Okay, shoebox, keep checking the bulletin board. You're doing a good job. Keep bringing stuff in. Next week. Okay, and then also, what? Next week's cutoff. Okay, I think they know that. Okay. But my wife, do you want to come up here and announce that? I think they heard. Okay. All right, and then the, the other thing is you can contribute to the postage. Um, that's ten dollars per box for every box that we assemble. So uh, the general fund, we usually that's where we take it from. But if you want to contribute towards that, you can do it. Just simply put a gift in the offering and say for shoebox, and we'll put that towards the postage. And then the shoebox assembling is going to be in two weeks. It's going to be on a Saturday, the sixteenth. It's at eleven a.m. There's a sign up in the back. After it's over assembling, there's going to be lunch, right, Denise? Right. Denise is going to make sure we have lunch after it's all over. And again, the more the merrier. It's a lot of fun. It doesn't take long. Um, last year, for example, we assembled 160 boxes in just a little over an hour. And the reason we're able to do so much so fast is because it's very streamlined. Uh, my wife has been working at coordinating this for multiple years, and every year she's learned something new and streamlined to where now it's a real science. She's got it down really down pat, so we, we come in and we do it, and it happens so fast. All right, and then next we have in two weeks will be the luncheon after the morning service. The sign-up sheet is up, right, Denise? Yes. So you can begin perusing that, signing up, and we're looking forward to that coming in two weeks. Okay, next, I have a thank you. Let me read it to you. Dear Pastor Duff and all our friends at Rockland Baptist Church, thank you so much for your very generous gift of $500. What a surprise. We loved reading all the notes and signatures in the card. We certainly have some dear friends at Rockland Baptist Church. Love, Greg and Debbie Davis. So I was finally able to deliver the card that you signed and the gift that you contributed to and they got that, and so they sent this thank you. So thank you again for being so faithful and kind in your giving. Okay, <clears throat> and then after that, I have an update. I've been in communication with Marilyn about her granddaughter, Katie, who we announced last week was having some complications in pregnancy. And the one time I talked to Marilyn, she said, everything looks good. And I'm like, good. And then the next day it was like, well, maybe not so much. So I did not put Katie on the prayer list because I was under the impression everything was going to be fine. And now it's like, well, so if you have your prayer list there, you just want to add her name to the bottom of the list, Katie. And we want to pray that she's able to carry full term for the pregnancy, that it goes full term. Okay. And then, uh, let's see, Judy's back. Yay. Judy's here, all the way from Scotland. Welcome back. And then also Margaret's back. I bet you didn't expect me to mention you, Margaret. You're back too. And Randy's very happy you're back. Right, Randy? She won't be here next week. Oh. You just ruined it. Okay. All right, a few prayer requests I want to mention to pray about. Um, first of all, if you've got the newsletters at the table there, one of them is from Paul Decker, UB campus minister. They are in their fall retreat, which is going through this weekend, and he's asking for prayer that the college students would be really touched in that retreat. So it's a very strong spiritual emphasis during the retreat, so he's, he's asking us to pray for the students. And then also, um, Diane, where are you? You're hiding. Okay, so Diane's got a friend by the name of Colleen. She's going to have a knee replacement tomorrow. Mm -hmm. 
And then Jared is not here, but he had gallbladder surgery on Friday, and he went home the same day, as you hope to do, and he did, so that's good. Has he been a very good patient at home? Yes. Okay. That's wonderful to hear. I'm not so good, so I'm glad he's better. Okay, so remember Jared as he recovers. And then also, uh, if you haven't seen it on TV, maybe by now you have, there's a vote on Tuesday. Okay? And we really, really, really need to pray that believers step up and do their civil duty. Okay? Conference I was at said that they gave the numbers of how many believers will probably not vote. And it's just shameful. It's shameful. 53 million. I don't know. I don't know. I don't remember, and I'm not going to quote a number from guesswork. I'm just going to say it's shameful. And uh, Ken Ham, which is the, he founded the ministry there where I was at in Kentucky. He said to not vote is just like doing what Pontius Pilate did when he washed his hands, saying, I really have nothing to do with the crucifixion of Jesus. And in reality, he voted, even though he said he did. And when you don't vote, you are voting. That's the reality. Not voting is voting. So we need to really pray that brothers and sisters in Christ will step up to the plate and do their duty on Tuesday. Okay, let's pray. <clears throat> Father in heaven, we're thankful for your kindness to us and your blessing upon us and the opportunity we have to be here in this country. And we don't take that for granted. It's a great privilege, but also it's a great responsibility. We're so thankful that you're here with us in our midst. We do give you praise for those that are celebrating birthdays this week, Olivia and Lizzie. And Kristen, we would pray that it would be a special week for them as they celebrate this special day in their lives. We also, Lord, think about the thank you that we got from the Davises, Greg and Debbie. And it was a great privilege to be partnered with them for so many years in ministry. And then to even show appreciation to them as they finished up that time of ministry. And I'm so happy and thankful for what we were able to do for them as a group of believers. And then, Lord, we think about needs. We think of Katie, um, the Warner's granddaughter, that you would help in her pregnancy to go full term, that everything would work out. We're thankful that the baby right now is healthy and whole, and the mother is too, but we would pray that you would continue to be with them in the days ahead. We also think of the retreat going on for the college students from UB. We would pray for the spiritual emphasis that many of them would be changed and affected by what's communicated from the Bible, and that many of their hearts would be changed. We also, Lord, we think of Colleen, this friend of Diane, going for surgery tomorrow. We would pray for safe, safety in the surgery and no complications, that she'll get through it well. And then we also, Lord, we think of Jared, his recovery at home from gallbladder surgery. We pray that you'll continue to help him to heal up uh, efficiently. And we're thankful, Lord, that the surgery was successful. And then lastly, we pray for the election on Tuesday for local and national uh, decisions to be made on candidates and also legislation in our area to be decided on. We would pray for wisdom and guidance among every believer going to vote, that they would do what you would have them to do, that they would make the right choices, the choices that would please you and honor you. Yes. And that's what we would ask more than anything. Thank you for hearing our prayers. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, let's go to hymn number 495. It's right after 494. I want to make this very easy this morning. Okay, so 495, and we're just going to sing the first verse only, and then greet one another. So join me in standing, number 495.
to all in Macedonia and Achaia who believe. For from you the word of the Lord has sounded forth, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith toward God has gone out, so that we do not need to say anything. They're, they're living by faith was having an impact on all believers in Greece and even in the world at large. What do you think about that? Is that good? I think it's very good. Is there any issue with their living? My immediate answer would be no. Until I read the Apostle's comment in chapter 3. Let's go to chapter 3, verse 9 to 10. Chapter 3, verse 9 and 10. He writes, For what thanks can we render to God for you, for all the joy with which we rejoice for your sake before our God? Night and day, praying exceedingly that we may see your face and perfect what is lacking in your faith. And I stopped right there and I'm kind of stunned that they lack in any way concerning their faith in Jesus. I mean, this group can't be lacking at all, is my thought, until we went into chapter 4. And we go to verse 3. So let's go to chapter 4, verse 3. We looked at this last week. For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you should abstain from sexual immorality. Our faith in Jesus has a direct impact upon how we live in this world, especially concerning that word sexual purity. How is our faith in Jesus and our sexual purity connected? Well, here's the Apostle's answer to this question from another letter that he wrote. Listen. Should we keep on sinning when we don't have to? For sin's power over us was broken when we became Christians and were baptized to become a part of Jesus Christ through his death the power of your sinful nature was shattered. Your old sin-loving nature was buried with him by baptism when he died. And when God the Father, with glorious power, brought him back to life again, you were given his wonderful new life to, are you ready for this? Enjoy. Imagine that, that we have the life of Jesus to enjoy. How did we become Christians? By faith in Jesus Christ. And he would go on to say, by faith as Christians, we were given his wonderful new life to enjoy and to live. Sin's power was broken the moment we entered into Jesus by faith. So I think this is why Paul states what he does in verse 4 and 5. Look at this. That each of you should know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor, not in passion of lust, like the Gentiles who do not know God. What keeps us from living like unbelievers in sexual immorality? What keeps us from doing that? It is Knowing God by faith. That's what does it. It is having his divine nature and his life by faith that causes us, every one of us, to live differently. Now, let me ask you this question. Can we stumble and fall in this area of sexual purity? Can we? Yes, yes we can. But our faith in Jesus will not allow us to remain there. Okay? David, who had his greatest failure in this area, wrote long ago, listen to this, the steps of good men are directed by the Lord. He delights in each step they take. If they fall, it isn't fatal. 
for the Lord holds them with his hand. Let me ask you a question. How strong is that hand? It's very strong. It can hold us. Our bond with the Lord, get this, is unbreakable. In spite of this unbreakable bond, we learn more about the trials that these believers are going through in verse 6 and 7. Look at verse 6 and 7. That no one should take advantage of and defraud his brother in this matter, because the Lord is the avenger of all such, as we also forewarned you and testified. For God did not call us to uncleanness, but in holiness. Amen. This was a challenge to their faith in living pure lives. He's challenging them what they ought to do. And hence, the previous warning and the continued warning in verse 8. Look at verse 8. Therefore, he who rejects this does not reject man, but God, who has also given us his Holy Spirit. He's challenging them to rise up and live like people that belong to Jesus Christ. You wouldn't think he would have to do that, would you? After what we learned in chapter 1 and all the things that we've read. Let me ask you this question now. Do these people living in Thessalonica, do they seem more human due to their struggles with purity to us? Do they seem more human? I would say they do. Another commendable trait in their lives is their labor of love. <coughs> and according to Paul, whatever is present in this area could be increased. Let's back up to chapter 3 and verse 12. Look at what he states here. And may the Lord make you increase and abound in love to one another and to all just as we do to you. And I i got to stop and ask myself now, in chapter 1, they're commended for their labor of love. But in chapter 3, in verse 12, I'm like, wait a minute. Why does he say this? Let's investigate further. Let's go back to chapter 4, and let's go to verse 9. But concerning brotherly love, you have no need that I should write to you. For you yourselves are taught by God to love one another. Now, he starts by saying brotherly love, okay? What is brotherly love? I think an easy way to define it is this. Are you ready? Family love expressed among family members. Does that make it a little more understandable? Brotherly love. It's family love expressed among family members. And to be even more specific, it is whatever we share as members of God's family for one another. All of us, I think in this room, would do whatever we could for one another. Would that be right? I would agree. What's interesting about this love that we share in God's family is that we didn't learn to do it naturally. We didn't learn to do it naturally. This love for one another was received from where? From above. How? John the Apostle writes, You have received the Holy Spirit, and He lives within you, in your hearts, so that you don't need anyone to teach you what is right. For He teaches you all things, and He is the truth and no liar, and so, just as he has said, you must live in Christ, never to depart from him. So the Holy Spirit has brought to us a new meaning of love expressed for one another in God's family. That's the truth. And you see, this love defines us. It defines us. And that's what Jesus predicted. He said, a new commandment 
I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, all will know that you are my disciples, if you have love one for another. That love defines us. That's what Jesus is saying. And that love, we have been made to understand it from above by the Holy Spirit coming to live inside of us. Was this love evident in this young group of believers living in Thessalonica? I think the answer is yes. And we might say, how exactly was it evident? Look at verse 10. And indeed, you do so toward all the brethren who are in all Macedonia. All the believers living in Macedonia included the cities of Philippi, Berea, Thessalonica, and all the places in between. Again, I think everything is good. I mean, they're not only overflowing with love amongst themselves, they're overflowing with love for the other churches in these other cities. And it's evident. And they're overflowing with love for everybody in between. This is good. But not so fast. Look at the second part of verse 10. But we, notice, urge you, brethren, that you increase more and more. Urge is a strong word, indicating that their love needs what? Improvement. In some specific ways. Now again, I'm, I'm stunned. People like this need some improvement concerning their love. Well, in what ways would he suggest? Let's go to verse 11. This might surprise you. Look at verse 11. That you also aspire to lead a quiet life. This is a big clue that things are not what they seem. A quiet life is the opposite of one known to be what? A lightning rod for trouble. You see, we can be a source of conflict involving our behaviors and our mouths. What leads to this type of troubling life is a lack of peace and a lack of calm. Where? Right here. When our insides are constantly churning like a hurricane or a volcano, then I can promise you it's going to spill out all the time. It's going to. Here's an example written by James for our learning. Listen to this. If you want to know what God wants you to do, ask him, and he will gladly tell you. For he is always ready to give a bounty, bountiful supply of wisdom to all who ask him. He will not resent it. But when you ask him, be sure that you really expect him to tell you. For a doubtful mind will be as unsettled as a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. And every decision you then make will be uncertain as you turn first this way and then that. If you don't ask with faith, don't expect the Lord to give you any solid answer. Now, this individual being described by James won't listen. And will constantly be in trouble, thus troubling everyone around them. And of course, they will not remember this, spoken by James, but this might sound familiar. Dear brothers, don't ever forget that it is best to listen much, speak little, and not become angry. For anger doesn't make us good as God demands that we must be. When we lose our temper, who do we hurt? Everyone, right? Everyone. 
An even more troubling comment about the mouth involved an older group of believers, older, living in Galatia. They were older in the faith than these in Thessalonica. And Paul wrote to them, Dear brothers, you have been given freedom. Not freedom to do wrong. Listen to this. But freedom to love and to serve each other. For the whole law can be summed up in this one command. Love others as you love yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, beware, lest you be consumed by one another. So let me ask us, have we ever bitten off someone's head in anger? Huh? Probably. Ever gotten so mad we complain about every little thing we don't like as the fault of someone who happens to love us unquestionably like a family member? Probably. Let me ask you a question. Did that feel loving to the person that was getting it from you? Did that feel loving? I would say probably not. Well, if not, then I'd say, boy, we got some fence mending to do with them, don't we? And if we are struggling with having peace and calm inside, then our love is going to be strained, strained toward everybody we come in contact with. What's another area needing to be improved in their love for one another? Well, look again at verse 11. This one really caught me by surprise. Right there it says, to mind your own business. Did you hear that? That's what he wrote. To mind your own business. I think it's too easy to meddle where we shouldn't. What do you think? Hmm? Maybe it would be wise to say, I want to ask a question, but if this shouldn't be asked, tell me and I'll understand. What do you think? That, might that be a good way to approach something? When you're a person given to meddling? It seems every generation in Christ struggles with this slippery slope of wanting to know everything about everyone. Privacy is not as respected as it should be. Paul wasn't the only one to comment on this issue. Peter wrote, be happy if you are cursed and insulted for being a Christian. For when that happens, the Spirit of God will come upon you with great glory. Does that sound good? You guys are being real quiet. Does that sound good? Yes. Okay. Maybe it's because we're under conviction. I don't know. Okay. All right. Then he goes on. He says, don't let me hear of does that sound like a dad talking to children? Don't let me hear of, okay, of your suffering for murdering or stealing or making trouble or being a busybody and prying into other people's affairs. That doesn't sound so good, does it? I don't think it sounds good at all. Now, what seems to be the motivation to know more concerning others than we should. Well, I'll let these Proverbs answer that, okay? Now, don't laugh. Some of these might cross you as funny by what's written in the Proverbs, but listen, okay? First of all, a gossip goes around spreading rumors while a trustworthy man tries to quiet them. Don't tell your secrets to a gossip unless you want them broadcast to the world. That's a proverb. Fire goes out for lack of fuel, and tensions disappear when gossip stops. So I think as we're learning here, it is the desire to gossip about others, which points, I think, to a lack of love 
and a lack of self-control. What do you think? Does that sound right? Who is our model for loving self-control? It's Jesus. Listen to Peter's description of our Lord. Christ, who suffered for you, is your example. Follow in his steps. He never sinned, never told a lie, never answered back when insulted. When he suffered, he didn't threaten to get even. He left his case in the hands of God, who always judges fairly. I think what we're learning here is that the love of these believers in Thessalonica is not perfect. Would that seem to be? But it's rather imperfect towards one another. Now let me ask you this question. Has our love been perfected yet? No. no. Not yet. So we're in the same boat with them. Our love hasn't been perfected yet either. Okay, what is the final issue in how they're loving one another? Well, look again at verse 11. And to work with your own hands as we commanded you. Now, that's a very interesting comment. It was quite common in this society for slaves to do the dirty work. And free people avoided, in that way, getting their hands dirty. That was common in the society. <coughs> Meaning, in that society, they lived off the efforts of others laboring in that society. And this had drifted into the group of believers in which some were littering off the work of others and becoming a burden. What was going on in society had drifted into the group of believers. And it was happening. What is the simple guideline? It is to be responsible for yourself by managing your own affairs properly. Or we would say, learn to hold a job the right way and provide for your own needs. Here's a comment made by Paul about his own conduct when he was among the believers in Thessalonica. Listen to this. He wrote, You remember, brethren, our labor and toil, for laboring night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you. We preach to you the gospel of God. So what he was saying was, we did everything in our power, we got our hands dirty so that you wouldn't have to carry us and be a heavy burden on your shoulders. And this is a comment made by Paul to his associate Timothy about being responsible for others. Listen to this. He says, let me remind you again that a widow's relatives must take care of her and not leave this to the church to do. Then the church can spend its money for the care of widows who are all alone and have nowhere else to turn. So if I understand that right, believing families are to be responsible for their own needs and their family members. That's what he's saying. Now you wouldn't think that the people in Thessalonica, that this would be them, but according to what he's saying here, if the shoe fits, you have to wear it. Why are all these issues relating to love so vital as to require space in this letter to address them? Why? Well, I think there's a two-part answer to this, okay? The first part is right there at the beginning of verse 12, and it begins with the word that. Notice what he writes. That you may walk properly toward those who are outside. <laughs> You know, the people that are outside are not the people that are inside. The people that are outside, they would be unbelievers. People that are not in the faith, inside. So I think what he's telling us is, we're being watched. 
by unbelievers in all of these things that he listed in verse 11. We're being watched. They are viewing what is true or false about Jesus based upon our conduct as a group and individually. What do we want them to conclude about Jesus? That's the point he's getting at. What do we want them to say about Jesus? Well, here's what he said. By this, all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. That's what he was saying. And Luke wrote this. He said, Barnabas went on to Tarsus to hunt for Paul. When he found him, he brought him back to Antioch, and both of them stayed there for a full year, teaching the many new converts. It was there at Antioch that the believers were first called Christians. You see, that was a nickname given by unbelievers <coughs> to believers, and it meant this, little Christ. Or these people are little Jesuses. And I think that was a good thing. You know, on the other hand is, I've seen this happen, and maybe you have too. Probably the most telling remark I've ever heard about this came from my own brother. My own flesh and blood. Who I would say is not in the faith. But I can remember him saying very clearly to me one time, in a group. He named off a person that from the place where he was employed and he says, I wouldn't give you two cents for that guy. And he says he's a Christian. And he sure don't do his job. Maybe you've heard that in your circles too. Boy, that's a sorry picture of Jesus, isn't it? A sorry picture. What do those watching us think of us based on our love for one another? Are they convinced or not? Let me tell you a good story. Wandy Hackett. I had the chance to spend quite a bit of time with her family. And this is what I would tell you with a smile on my face. They were quite impressed by the body of believers as to how they loved Wandy. You know what I'd say? Yes! <laughs> that makes me feel so good to hear that. Praise God. There's one family that's looking and saying, we like what we see. We like it. It looks like Jesus. Look at the second answer he gives right here in verse 12. And again, it begins with the word that. And that you may lack nothing. And that you may lack nothing. Love is seen by being unselfish rather than taking advantage of others. Love is giving, not taking from others. If they would act this way, then they wouldn't be depending on others to do work for them and to provide for their needs constantly without end in sight. They would be doing their own work to lessen the burden of others instead of adding to it. There's a good chance that we're not guilty of everything that Paul described as needing improvement among this group of believers. But it could be we're in need of, say, one thing or two things to improve upon. We aren't everything we should be just yet. So let us begin the work of what? Increasing our love for one another so we won't be lacking as he was writing at the end of verse 12. Amen? Let's bow our heads for prayer. Father in heaven, as we come before you right now, we just, again, 
we pour out our hearts before you knowing that it's a blessing to be in your family. It's a blessing to be one of many. It's a blessing to share in the faith of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a blessing to have the opportunity and privilege of loving one another. It's a blessing to persevere because of the hope we have in Jesus. We have so much from you. And we realize as we read through this description about what was going on with those in Thessalonica with their love, we can't help but, I think, in many ways, sometimes look at some description and kind of smile about it because it seems like, what's that doing in the Bible? Or reading something else and, and going, I can't imagine that he would write that in the Bible. But yet we understand that he was doing it for whatever was needed to help them progress and improve in their labor of love. And so again, we come before you and we look at ourselves and as we've answered the question, our love hasn't been perfected yet either. So the truth is we still need help. We still need your help to grow and improve in this area of loving one another. Here within this body of believers and even as we go outside this group, we still need help in loving. And so whatever the area might be, and every one of us in here could have a different need. But what we're asking, Father, is meet the need in our lives. Help us in whatever way that we fall short, that we might continue to progress and grow in Christ. We do love you and we thank you for this wonderful opportunity we have to observe communion, this very sacred observance. And so help us to prepare our hearts in the best way possible for this wonderful privilege you've bestowed upon us. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, Beth's going to play two verses of Scripture, I mean of the hymn, not Scripture, the hymn, and then we'll prepare our hearts to take communion. So with your heads bowed, this is the time for us to prepare ourselves. <clears throat>
Apostle Paul, he writes, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take ye, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Bob, would you lead us in prayer, please? Let us bow our heads in prayer. Lord, as we commune with you this morning, we just we try to wrap our minds around the sacrifice that you made for us. We thank you always, Lord, for your love, your grace, your mercy. And we ask for your help, Lord, to make us worthy of your sacrifice. Amen. Amen. So we're on the fourth verse of 493. All right, so join me in standing. I think we'll start at the second verse again, and then we'll go to the end of the song and we'll be some 